Hi, this is Greg Boyer, trombonist with the NPG Band. As we speak, I'm on my way up the stairs. I open the door and I enter the upper room with Joe Kelly on WVOF on your FM dial. And that was uh, Xenophobia from Prince and the MPG live from the box set One Night Alone. And one of the fellows who plays horns uh, with Prince and the MPG, he's been in the music biz with some of the most talented folks around as he is talented himself. He's performed with uh, Maceo Parker, George Clinton, the P-Funk All-Stars, and is now with Prince and the MPG. His name is Greg Boyer, and uh, we want to thank him for stopping by the Upper Room with Joe Kelly and WVOF on, on uh, short notice. So, so thanks, Greg. Hey, my pleasure. No problem. So, so getting uh, the rare time off from, from all your musical work, what do you have to do in the meantime? Well, you know, time off really involves you know, seeing um, my family and and just relaxing for a minute. You know, right. Rigors of the roads. Are they moving from hotel to hotel, city to city? And then in case as it's been the past couple of weeks, you know, eight, nine, ten hour a day rehearsals mm -hmm. and stuff is just... Nice to just get back here and just take it easy. I don't even take the horn out of the case most of the time when I'm <laughs> right, home. Right, right. And, uh, you know, you being rehearsing on the West Coast, any particular reason why you guys rehearse on the West Coast, or is just everybody's out there? Well, if I had to guess, I'd probably say it's as cold as the Dickens in Minneapolis. Yeah, right. I just wanted to rehearse somewhere warm. <laughs> yeah, but, but you're an East Coast guy originally growing up in, in D.C. and now out in uh, Maryland. Yeah. Um, no, no plans to move out there permanently, right? <laughs> out, well, out in California. Well, I don't want to leave the area until right. the kids graduate from high school, right? Because you know, along with being a whole bunch of other things, I am a daddy. Yeah. So I want to kind of stay close so that when I do come home, I'm able to keep an eye on them, and give them some input, and all that other stuff fathers are supposed to do. So, so how how understanding are, are your kids about? dad leaving home for stretches and do you get to see him while you're on the road not a lot uh, they all have email and you know we talk back and forth and i call home and stuff but basically they're like you know well my son just came out and said can't you get a gig in town right right hopefully that'll happen right oh yeah i mean any project that you know i'm Finally, trying to get something of a solo nature rolling, but you know, being a side man and stuff, and not having to worry about all the the managerial particulars, has kind of gotten me complacent. But you know, I do have a lot of stuff that uh, I'd like to do, mm -hmm. and quite a few musical directions I want to take it. So I have to figure that out first and foremost, and then start recording. And when I decide to go on tour for myself, you know, I want to make sure that I'm not spending, you know, 900 days a year gone away. I'm trying to keep it where I can just have it 50-50 if possible. So so knowing knowing your background and that you played a lot of instruments, how about uh, when you're writing your own material? How, how do you start out writing? Well, sometimes um, if there's lyrics involved, they come to mind first, and sometimes the tracks come to mind first. Mm -hmm. um, I might think of a melody and arrange around it, or I might think of a groove and write a melody over top of it. It's really no set way for me to write, or even a set style per se, because you know, I'm influenced by so many things. You know, it's just um, I just create on the fly. Right. Make a long story short. Well, your primary instrument that people see is playing the trombone, but. How many other instruments do you play, and, and would you consider proficient enough to lay down in the studio on your own material? Well, I, as a teenager, you know, probably dabbled in all of the instruments. I mean, you know, brass, woodwinds, percussion, took piano lessons for a minute, and, and fooled around with a friend's violin. So, you know... I know enough about all of the instruments to write for them and stuff, but right now, with me being primarily a trombone player, anything I have resembling chops on another instrument is almost non-existent now. Uh huh. 
I so, played bass in rehearsal the other day. And, oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah, because um, Rhonda Smith left early, so they were jamming, and I said, well, let me just pick up the bass and see what's up. Uh-huh. It felt like I had never touched it before. You know, all <laughs> the things I wanted to do, I just couldn't do. Right. And it's just a matter of just sitting down and, you know, getting the muscles familiar again. But as far as laying down tracks and stuff, I'll probably just go ahead and, you know, do what I do best and and lead the pros to the other <laughs> instruments. Do, do you love to sing as well? Yeah. Uh-huh. Doesn't necessarily mean I sing good, but right. I love it. Right. Yeah, I um well, I like singing background vocals because, you know, with the with the ear thing, you know, it enables me to like pick certain spots that are empty or, you know, notes that are missing and kinda of like add my input where, you know, something is just your basic one three five harmony. I like to stick other little things in there that you know, normally singers wouldn't think of, and all of a sudden, what was a background vocal thing sounds like maybe a, a big band saxophone section. Right, right. But uh, singing lead, it just takes um, a lot more energy, to, and it just takes more than just knowing the notes. I mean, anybody that sings for a living to tell you, you know, anybody can hit the notes. Well, not anybody, but those that can hit the notes is just not enough. And... You know, I, I would like to sing on, you know, some of the stuff that I'm doing eventually, but, you know, well, it's not going to be, you know, a, a Grammy-winning performance or, you know, something that is, is just going to wow them, everybody to feel how money. Right. So, so how about with your own material, how would you foresee uh, putting a band together and what would you have in the band that would fit best for your material? Well, you know, for the... Um, for the jazz stuff, I either want to go with a big band direction mm -hmm. and um, mostly acoustic stuff and for the funky uh, stuff that I'm thinking about writing or that I have written. It's, you know, your basic funk rhythm section and maybe a horn section of at least three horns. Right. You know, just for color purposes. And then there's the... Um, uh, Latin, Afro-Cuban jazz stuff that um, I have written. Of course, I'm just going to get a basic rhythm section for that. You know, congueros, timbales, and claves, and cowbell experts. And, Sounds and, like a real interesting project. you you got to get in the studio to do it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I almost feel like I need to cut three different CDs, right? Just to cover the whole thing, because you know, no record label is, is, is going to sit there and say, "Oh, okay, play every kind of music you can think of." You know, they lose that ability, you know, pigeonhole you, right? Right? Categorize you if you do something like that. So you, know, you got to kowtow with those uh, label execs to some degree. Sure. You know, if, if for you to get distribution and stuff like that. Otherwise, you try to do this on your own, you just end up selling it out of your trunk. Yeah. And your Some... trunk isn't everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So so the key is, uh, I mean, I guess for any indie is to get uh, some great distribution. And, <clears throat> and, yeah. I, and I guess the folks you've been working with lately for the past few years, Prince and, and his organization, really, you guys have been all about that. So Yeah. Yeah. And uh, working out in L.A., rehearsing, and and uh, I guess tickets went on sale today for you guys, uh, the Musicology School's In uh, upcoming tour. A as a musician, you guys, you know, Prince is notorious for, for those long rehearsals. Um, wh what's the feeling as a musician yourselves before you go out on this big uh, U.S. tour? Excitement or want to get it going right away? or? Mm. You know, the the novelty of it wore off a long, long time ago. It, to me, it's like, well, time to go to work. Right. You know, and I think of going on tour, I think of bills getting paid. You're right. <laughs> faces being seen. So, and mu <laughs> so musicians are everyday people. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Like I said, you know, without being the leader of the band, you don't have to worry about all that other stuff like appearances and 
photo shoots and magazines and although you know in some instances you know, mm-hmm. you're just as much a part of the visibility thing as maybe the leader of the band would be now now you, you guys have been rehearsing for so long and but everybody in the band accomplished in their own right um what is, what is real necessary to put in all those long hours before you guys hit the road what what why does it take that many hours well um it takes that long to get to a point where large cues aren't necessary. You know, sometimes all it'll take is a glance, mm-hmm. and everybody moves together. That's really all it is: is training to work as a as a team. Right. And sometimes it takes long hours, depending on the music, and especially with a, a library as big as Prince's is. You know, you want to be good on all this stuff, not just the stuff you go on tour with. Yeah, right. You know, the what would be, I guess, the set list for um, the show that you're trying to do. I mean, he does, like, after parties, and you um, you never know what he's going to call. Right. And instead of saying, okay, we're going to rehearse so-and-so because we're going to play it tonight, all of that's been done up front. So did you, be prior to joining the MPG, did you listen to a lot of Prince music um, through the whole catalog? And- well, I've always been a fan of his anyway. I mean, the guy's an incredible musician mm-hmm. and, um, you know, incredible artist, period. You know, from, I mean, every aspect of music business, he's pretty much mastered it. So you know, I've been a fan of his. Now, I kind of like lost track of a lot of his catalog in the later years because um, well, I was concentrating more on, um, and, you know, other avenues and stuff. But, um, yeah, a lot of the songs he said, let's play, I knew them already. It's just a matter of learning, you know, the new arrangements, if there were any. Do you, do you guys get a, a lot of input in as far as what songs get thrown in the mix for a tour? Mm, for this group, no, we don't get a lot of input, you know. Mm. I mean, once we know what the song is, then we start giving right. input. But we yeah. should we should let our listeners know that that aren't aware Greg Boyer is the uh, horn arranger for uh Prince and the MPG, which is which is a real big task. So uh what goes into arranging the horns and well, getting everything set? I would say eighty percent of the ideas are Prince's ideas. Now, my job is to transfer those ideas to the rest of the horn section, which means, you know, writing out the parts so that in an instance where maybe Maceo can't make it and he decides he wants to call someone else, you know, the music is available. Right. Because, I mean, you're talking about, like I, we said earlier, hours of rehearsal. And... You know, without being there, the only thing you can go by really is something written. So I make sure a lot of that is down on paper. Mm-hmm. And then there are the parts where, you know, he lets me just write the horn arrangements and I'll write them and then he'll come along and say, okay, that part's good. Maybe leave this other part out. And, you know, either way, look at it as um, it's a joint operation by the time it's all over and done with. Now, and then course you maceo's been uh with you guys performing you guys have performed together for many years how about when maceo's not there and the different vibing off the different sax players are the different sounds to, to each one like candy and eric leeds and, oh yes yeah, definitely uh, different i mean first off you're not going to find anybody else out there with a sound like maceo's mm-hmm. and then you're not going to find anybody out there that approaches playing like him that guy's one of a kind you know once he's gone um i don't know who's going to be here to fill the void unless you know it's going to be somebody that's a student of all of his uh, recordings Mm -hmm. so you know if he's missing it's going to change definitely but the whole thing is no matter who's there you want it to sound tight and you want it to sound vibrant right and and a seasoned veteran can pull that off with no problems, you know, like an Eric Lee's or like Najee or Candy, and um, or even Eddie M, who was um, kind of like a 
showed up unexpected and sat in with us the other night we were in San Francisco. Right. Yeah. So how how about uh, no no trumpet in the horn section, right? No trumpet right. as yeah. of now. No, he um. From uh, what Prince was telling me, there was just something that he didn't like about the trumpet. It's a very forward, brassy kind of sound. I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm a trombone. I'm not too far off of that. But <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Start getting a little worried, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. I think he just, well, really how I, I think I got in was he really liked the way that Maceo and I blended on stage. It's like, you know, one person... It, but it sounded like it was an idea of both people as, you know, as far as how the lines rolled out. And I pride myself on the fact of being able to mirror uh, the image or the style of anybody I'm playing next to. And uh, that might be, you know, the selling point of how Maceo got me to gig. And then Prince saw that. He's like, well, I think I want that combination. Yeah. And it's, it's gone really well that you guys uh, have added to Prince's band. And, uh, we, we, you know, I think we should get into some more music, which uh, showcases your great playing on the trombone, which is uh, from, once again, the One Night Alone live box set. It's uh, the other side of the pillow. And, you know, it w- I-, I caught the show up in Montreal, one of, I guess one of the last shows on that tour. Yeah. Um, and just to see Prince vibing off of you, uh Tell tell us a little bit about the chemistry during that song and you and Prince. Well, Prince, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. I just decided to pull a plunger out one time. And he became a really big fan of trombone with a plunger. Okay. So he wanted to take it back to your 1930s smoky juke joints kind of feel. I said, yeah, you know, play that thing with the plunger. So I was like, okay. There you go. <laughs> and me being, you know, having a propensity for clowning at times, <laughs> right. just kind of took it up a notch, and he went right along with it. So we'll give a listen to it right now. My special guest right now, uh, multi-talented musician, Mr. Greg Boyer, who has uh, got a few more days off before heading back to rehearsal for the upcoming Musicology Schools In Tour, Prince and the MPG. And uh, you can go to mpgmusicclub.com for all the uh, upcoming tour dates and, and purchases. And uh, got a, I don't know if you know, there's a nice picture. As we record tonight, Prince is uh, on Tavis Smiley Show. So, uh, you know, check out all the information there. And this is Greg Boyer as a member of Prince and the MPG, The Other Side of the Pillow, live. And if you just tuned in, that is uh, Prince and the MPG live from the One Night Alone box set, The Other Side of the Pillow, which features a great uh, solo right there from my special guest this evening. And uh, he's been kind enough to stop by for being a part of the March Minneapolis music special the entire month of March. And uh, his name is Greg Boyer, and they're getting ready to go on tour officially. Real busy uh, Prince and the MPG and... uh, you guys will be out here, I guess, March 15th, Prince inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And, um, you know, that seeing that, how, how, do, how does, I guess you can't speak too much for him, but uh, seeing his career, do you, do you see that as being a real high point for him? Um, I mean, getting elected into the Hall of Fame of anything is, is, would be a high point. You know, anything that recognizes, you know, your work and being done so by your peers mm-hmm. it's got to be very satisfying to anybody but you know i'm sure there are several high points but i i would almost um be willing to bet that this is definitely one of them right and uh musicology schools in and you know i was in the mpg music club chat room uh actually today and you know you got a lot of fans out there because I, I let people know you're coming on the show Oh, okay. And, and uh, they were really, really excited you were on. And, and you talked about some of the clowning on stage and everything. And actually, somebody put this, they wanted to know, I guess I'll throw it out right here. Yeah. They, they wanted to know on stage when you're making the faces and licking your lips, what's that about? They, they, that's what they wanted to ask you. Um, 
I don't know. You know, there are several parts during the show where I go from being in the band to just becoming a fan. Uh huh. And sometimes I'll hear something that somebody's playing, and it's just just really gut wrenching to me. I love hearing it, mm-hmm. and I react accordingly. And sometimes it's a face, and sometimes it's a move to one side or the other. And yeah, that's um pretty much that now. Um, I don't know about licking the lips. That's yeah. probably just you know to keep a seal, <laughs> right? Uh, um, well, I have to keep the mouthpiece moist, so right. I keep the the air inside because you know once um, mouthpiece goes dry, your flexibility leaves too. And you know, I just like to you know keep it nice and wet, so you know, I, just, I can continue playing without missing yeah. any notes. And, I've had people say, why did you do that? And say, hey, the mouthpiece is dry. That's it. Yeah. So uh, as, as a trombone player, uh, what are you playing on stage and what do, what do you use? Um, I have three custom trombones. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one I'm playing now is uh, a Schmelzer. It's built in Germany by Manfred Schmelzer. Okay. And I also have one built by Roy Lawler down in Florida. And Steve Shires up in uh, Boston built the third horn. And mouthpiece I'm playing on is a Todd Klontz prototype. He's a repairman at Rosso's Music and a fine trombone player to boot. And before I went to Europe a couple of years ago, he says, hey, Greg, try this out. And I tried it out, and he said if I liked it, I could just pay him when I got back. So first thing I did when I got back in the country was went over there you know, dropped him um, his asking the price. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. that's what I've been playing on for the past couple of years. Right. And uh, do, do you go out to uh, the NAM? Were you out there this year? I did go out there Saturday. I went out there, and um, and I ran into quite a few people, including several folks with P-Funk. And, uh-huh. And... Um, saw Chuck Drummer used to play with Arsenio Hall and all the list could go on man I was just yeah. seeing goo gobs of people out there that's like being at a college reunion right some, some of those stuff yeah 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 it is well you know our listeners out there who don't know you know from the early days of, of you getting into music do you want to talk a little bit about your, your family and, and music and what drew you to to turn into music and taking you this this far so far well my first memory of anything involving wanting or having an instrument was when I was about four years old. And there was something Glenn Millerish on television. It was still all black and white then. Uh huh. <laughs> Give you an idea how long ago that was. Well, you're still a young cat. Yeah, you know, I feel like I got a few good years yeah. left. I got to say that I'm, we're, we're around the same age. Yeah. Right. You know, if I'm lucky, I'm at the halfway point. Right, <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> But I just remember seeing saxophones up in the air. And I don't know, I don't remember asking for one or my mom seeing me and just thinking, hey, maybe he would like that. But anyway, Christmas rolled around. I got um, a battery-operated dinosaur, the same one that Fred drives at the um, Slate and Gravel. Right. (laughs) (laughs) And I got a plastic saxophone, and uh-huh. I pulled it out of the plastic, and I immediately blew on it and stuck it straight up in the air. And when it came time to join the band, I knew I wanted to play uh, a saxophone. Right. I said, you know, this is something that I could probably grow up doing, you know, along with playing baseball mm-hmm. and drawing, which is um, two of my other passions as a kid. But I started out playing saxophone at 10 years old. And just started going through instruments right away. I was curious as to how instruments worked because I was amazed at how easy it was to figure out how to play the saxophone. Now, mind you, I'm still a kid. I don't have anything resembling a a decent sound just yet, but I can get notes. So I was like this trumpet in my brother's closet. How do I get notes on that? And then it just went from instrument to instrument. and I eventually started playing tuba when I was 13 years old and trombone soon after that and bass a year after that and I was just playing any and everything I could get my hands on. 
Right. And I got my first gig playing tenor at 15 in some places I wasn't old enough to be in. Right. And about the time I turned 18 years old, I was going to join another band, but Scott Taylor was already playing saxophone. There's no way in the world I'm out playing Scott. That guy's a woodwind genius. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, okay, we don't have a trombone player. I'll play that. And that's how I started playing trombone. Do you, do you listen to a lot of other trombone players these days? Um, yeah, I do. Uh huh. Listen to, um, well, of course, listen to a lot of Fred Wesley. Right. And a lot of J.J. Johnson. You know, those are, you know, you like funk, that's Fred. You like jazz, that's J.J. Mm -hmm. And then there are some people that have taken it from there. You know, you have the likes of um, Steve Teray, Robin Eubanks, Isaac Smith, and... Oh, boy, the list is just endless. You know, the late Frank Rosalino, and Curtis Fuller. Oh, how, how, how about touring on the road since you guys will be upcoming touring? Do you bring a lot of music to listen to yourselves, or what do you, what do you listen to on the road? I'm mostly listening to, I listen to some tenor players, but I listen to a lot of um Old jazz stuff, you know, Cannonball Adderley, Miles Davis, Train, Jocko, you know, Weather Report. Right. So you got some great, great taste in music. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of um, Tito Puente, Jimmy Bosch, Eddie Palmieri. And wow, Jimmy Bosch. Yeah, he, he did a concert over here uh, this past year. Yeah. Yeah. So, so... I'm going to go, go way, way back and, and see if you'll admit this one. Uh, do you remember the first concert you ever attended? First one I ever attended? Yeah. A uh, big arena concert. Yes, I do. Uh-huh. I went to see Earth, Wind, and Fire at what used to be the Capitol Center. Oh, yeah. I remember that place. Yeah. 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 It changed it to USA Arena, but, you know... Old heads like us refuse to call it that. It's always going to be the Capitol Center. <laughs> and Wes Unsell getting the rebounds. Right? And Wes Unsell, yeah, Gus Johnson and Elvin Hayes, Fat Lady singing. Really? And my favorite memory of the Capitol Center is I'll meet you at Portal 12. Whenever we got lost, uh -huh. whenever we're going to meet somebody there, we'd always meet at Portal 12. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but no, Earth, Wind, and Fire was the uh, right. first concert I went to see. How about the first uh, record you bought? First record I ever bought? Um, I can't remember which one was the first I bought or the first was given to me. Oh, okay. Uh, or... First one that was given to me was Baby by Carla Thomas. Oh, right. Yeah. You, yeah. you still buy a lot of music yourself? Yeah, I do. Uh-huh. Yeah, I've got um almost a thousand CDs in my collection. Wow. And it covers everything. Right. So uh, if you just tuned in, my special guest is Greg Boyer, who is uh, the horn arranger, trombonist uh, for Prince and the MPG. And uh, we spoke earlier about uh, he's written a lot of songs and just looking for some time to get into the studio and, and uh, record some of this. And uh, also 19 years with the, the P-Funk crew and uh, George Clinton, the P-Funk All-Stars and... You know, you know, since you've been involved in so many, you know, growing up myself, like really important and, and talented bands, being in that mix and creating, writing songs and touring, do you look at it like this has really been something special we've done so far? Um, I didn't at first. Uh huh. You know, I approach all of this, or at least I have been, you know, for the past 10 or 15 years, like, it's all just another day at the office. And, you know, did you have a good day or a bad day? So I go in there and do a session or write some arrangements, and they came out nice. I would say I had a good day. Right. And I never thought of it being influential or, you know, something groundbreaking until, like, maybe someone like Skeet says, yeah, I heard so-and-so the other day. Did you do the horn arrangements that sound like something you did? And I was like, you know, I have a distinctive sound, and I just wasn't aware. You know, I was just doing what I felt. Mm -hmm. So Skeet is, uh, I think, from your area, right? 
Yeah, he's from Baltimore. Yeah. So, so you guys hooked up, and I guess that was, you know, you're, you're ticking in to getting in with the P-Funk, right? Yeah. Now, yeah. that's a very interesting story. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to school three semesters. It's me, uh, P-Funk, Horn, trumpet player Benny Cowan. Okay. And new um, P-Funk Horn member Scott Taylor. Now, the three of us are going to St. Mary's College, and Benny and I are just, like, dying to go out there and just make some money doing this. Right. And we both quit at the same time at the end of um, the December session in 77. Didn't really have anything planned and nowhere to go, really, but we were determined to make something happen. And we hooked up with Greg Thomas during that time, who um, who was... Um, God, he was still playing around Baltimore, and I'm trying to think, did Benny call him or did Greg call Benny? But they got together on this project, featured a lot of uh, ex-members of Madhouse, which you probably remember as oh, where yeah. Razor Sharp and Mudbone and and um, and Peanut Johnson came from. Mm-hmm. And there was some project there, and we all got it. We said we'd do the horn section stuff, and we rehearsed a couple of weeks, and that fell through. Unbeknownst to us, P Funk was having trouble, you know, with the whole mutiny thing at the time, and they had an interim horn section that was about to leave. Skeet calls um, Greg Thomas, who, along with Dennis Chambers and Kevin Oliver and a couple of other P Funk alums, all played in a band called Uncle Remus. So Skeet says, "Greg, you got a horn section? Uh-huh. There's a vacancy down here." And if you've got somebody to play with, learn these parts from Funk and tell that you can come down here and show them what you can do. And Greg said, okay, let's go down there and audition for this P-Funk gig. We auditioned in February, and in March we had the gig. So from, I'd say, a three-month span between us quitting college and up to that point, we were doing nothing, and all of a sudden we're playing with P-Funk. Wow. And I go from playing places that you know, where I'm making a dollar a night and there's a dirt on the floor well, uh-huh. actually the floor was dirt right <laughs> and in some places no roof to playing in these 15 20 thousand seat arenas it was right. culture shock yeah and how'd your family take to it that you leave at home to do this oh they're like well he's playing music for a living and stuff and you know he's this rock star and i hope i train this boy right where he don't go out there and just totally mess up right and, and leave some tickets for them when, when you come around for the gig, right? Well, it's P-Funk, man. You know, anybody can get in backstage at a P-Funk oh, concert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, your family definitely isn't exempt. So Right, right. I didn't have to worry about that too much. Now, now Torn... Now, now, Torn, 19 years with, with the P-Funk uh, crew and, you know, just 20, sometimes more people on stage and, you know... How, how is it different now as, you know, touring with uh, Prince and the MPG as far as going on the road? And, and you mentioned the eight to ten hour rehearsals prior to the tour. Mm-hmm. It, it's a lot different from those days, P-Funk days? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh-huh. I mean, P-Funk, I'd say maybe a little bit during Atomic Dog, but definitely during the uh, Nubian Nut Tour of 84, we locked ourselves away in a little storefront down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we would practice maybe, i say, six, seven hours a day mm-hmm. just working on stuff. And that went on for maybe about a week, maybe two weeks. I can't remember. All I know is we hit the road, and we were tight as Dick's hat band. Right. And But other than that, I've never seen P-Funk really do the – the hardcore rehearsal thing. They just showed up, you know, they know the songs and they just jam. Mm-hmm. And, you know, each member's input was different every night, which is why, you know, those shows, you know, you couldn't just see one. You know, you might totally miss a groove that wasn't there the night before. And, you know, George is a, a stickler for that. Just let the band play. Right. You know, don't move anything until you find something you like and then you just work it. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, so, I mean, that was the big difference. You know, George's thing was very jam-based, and Prince's thing is very precision-oriented. 
and, and at times P Funk and, and the Minneapolis music kind of join and, and work together occasionally. So so that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, you know let let me give a couple websites out that that we need to get out first. Greg Boyer's own website, which is gregboyer.net, and uh, you can go out there and, and read the bio on Greg and send him an email. And uh, also, uh, I'm not sure when this will. Well, I, it's going to air in the beginning of March, but I'm not sure if the contest is uh, still open. But housequake.com has a real nice uh, thing that you're hooked up with them. Uh, answering questions and and such, and do you know how long you're going to take questions? Um, that, well, actually, what they're doing is they're going to let all the questions come in, and they're going to take the the best twenty. Okay. And I'm going to answer those. I think I'm supposed to collaborate with the um with the uh, the webmaster there. Okay. And um, you know, I just look at the questions every day just to see what I have to get ready for and stuff. Right. Yeah, you got some good ones up there, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's some good ones, and some of them I just rather leave alone. You know? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind of felt the same way, but yeah. uh, but but it's nice people showing you the love, and they got a nice picture up you up there of you. And um, oh, there's nothing like it, man. You know. Yeah, how how you know the current crew that you know Prince and and the new Power Generation? How tuned into the people who are out there supporting you in concert and buying the records are, are you guys, do you guys go online a lot and, and how about Prince and yourself? I, I think that they do, you know, cause a lot of times, you know, I'll just casually mention something I saw on housequake or Prince.org or something. And, you know, they don't have some rebuttal. So I would think that they would, you know, probably have seen it or read something. Yeah. You know, for them to have an opinion like that. And there's some intense opinions. I mean, you know, we, we spoke a little bit about the Grammys and everything, and right, you know, th- these people analyze everything. <laughs> oh man, there's yeah. some really intense fans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I've, mean, I've had my my own show picked apart a little bit, so I guess it goes with the territory <laughs> up mm-hmm. there. But but you know, speaking of the Grammys, you guys opened up the Grammys out in L.A. Uh, about a week or so ago, and uh, what what was it like getting ready for that performance, and then? having to go out and you guys jammed uh, right after that yeah well getting ready for it we were rehearsing the actual grammy thing maybe about two weeks prior Mm -hmm. we just fooled around with how we're going to do it then maybe the last week it got really intense with the um choreography and stuff so um and then beyonce came down and of course she was working with us a couple of days too Right. So, you know, it was quite a bit of work going into that. So by the time we got there, it was like, okay, let's just go ahead and get this over with. It was right. nothing like, well, I hope I remember to do this or that. It was very much drilled in everyone's head what they had to do stepwise and, um, and musically. And uh, then you guys went off and played uh, the House of Blues, right? Now, yeah. LA? yeah. Right after we came off the stage, we got everything together and went, well, we went back to the hotel and chains first, then we went and did a sound check over in House of Blues mm-hmm. and played that night. So that was a long day. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we should make mention, everybody knows Prince and, you know, of course, very talented musician. And, and we'll be featuring a week of Prince's music uh, just prior to uh, his induction in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame here on the show. But uh, you got some other collaborators in the band. You want to make mention of some of the people in there? Um, well, there's Maceo, of course, and Candy Dolfer, who, um, is always, um, a guest on a Maceo set whenever we swing through Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And, um, then there's Rhonda Smith on bass, of course, and has been there probably longer than anybody else. Right. And John Blackwell playing drums, formerly of, uh, Cameo and Patti LaBelle and a few other things. Got to get his DVD. Have you checked out his DVD? Have you seen that? Yeah, I've seen yeah. bits and pieces of it. Right, man. right. Uh, as I call him, Octa Squid. <laughs> <laughs> Octa Squid. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's tremendous. Yeah, tr- tremendous he, drummer and a, yeah. and a tremendous showman as well. He's and yeah, a lot of fun to watch and listen to. How? And then you have uh, three keyboardists in the band. Yeah. Yeah, and, and our good friend Chance Howard, who was on the show uh, not too long ago. Yeah, yeah. Chance is. Um, it, you just really don't get 
the the full you know picture of just how great some of these guys are to you around them for a while. Mm-hmm. Now I'd heard a lot about Chance. I even um, sat in with this group. He and Kirk Johnson had a little thing that they were doing in downtown Minneapolis. Yeah, conversation piece, right? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, Chance is here. You know, the guy plays this, plays that. But man, I mean, that guy not only is is a great keyboard player and a bass player, but sings like you wouldn't believe. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, having what 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 is the uh, purpose? Can you see uh, having three keyboards in a band? Well, you know, a lot of that old Prince material is very uh, thick with keyboard parts, and mm-hmm. you know, so one person doesn't have to bear the brunt of the whole assignment. And it just helps to have a couple other people there. Then, you know, along with Chance and um, Rad. That's right, yeah. Yeah, who is um, a a great keyboard player. I mean, she plays everything. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing for us to sit down and just go through one jazz standard after another, you know, before rehearsal gets started. And, you know, she brings that and the vocal thing along with that. So you have a couple extra voices along with the keyboard players. And then uh, Renato, who is just, um, as far as synthesizers and stuff, this guy's like a genius, man. He just plays the patches and and all of the different sounds and stuff probably better than anybody I've ever seen. And I think he really shined on, on the, the Rainbow Children one night alone. Just, wow. Yeah. He, he really stood out for, for keyboards, yeah. And, oh, Definitely. Now, uh, you know, we, we haven't spoken as much as a, a guy who you've been with for, for quite a while and still go out on the road with him when you when you get a chance in between the Prince Project is Maceo Parker. And you guys, did you record part of his new album in Connecticut? Because I saw that in the liner notes. Yes, I did. Uh, I did all of the horns on there and all of the horn arrangements. And uh, w- Was it recorded in the studio here in Connecticut? Yes, it was. It was Carriage done up there in Stanford, yeah. Right, okay. Sure was. Yeah, next time you come this close, you got to come by our studios. We, you know, it's real nice. We have bands come in and play and everything. Yeah, I had no yeah. idea you were in that area. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've heard of Joe Kelly upper room, but I never knew where it was. Yeah, I'm twenty minutes from Stanford. We're, we're the closest big city is Bridgeport. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, you're always welcome to come by. Oh, so, absolutely. Appreciate the invite. Yeah. So, so Maceo's own music. Um, you guys, just an incredible band. I last saw you in Hartford. And, um, you know, what, what was it like working on Maceo's new record and and uh, the new things going on with Maceo? Well, the thing I really dug about Maceo was he says, you already know what you're doing just right. Okay. And, you know, there was no standing over my shoulder. There was no, um, you know, prerequisite or anything. He just says, just write the horns. And, you know, and having, um, to borrow a line from Boomerang, he said, I have complete autonomy. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and there's nothing like a, a, a green light as far as you can see. It just kind of make you just, that's when work doesn't appear to be as much of a job anymore. Mm-hmm. You know. And another Minneapolis cat who's uh, in Maceo's band, Morris Hayes. And uh, got a real nice spotlight out there for, the, I guess, the slow jam part, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that was something that Maceo hasn't really had. He's had great keyboard players in the past, but, you know, he never had anybody that brought almost, well, he he brought the funk, but it was just so gospel-laden. And right. And it was just, you know, it just fit right in with all the other chicken greases going on on the stage. Yeah, a lot of that going around, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So yeah. I, saw, I saw Will Bowl. So yeah. I, saw, I saw Will Bowlwares on uh, Rodney Jones' last record. Yeah. Yeah. You so. know, um, both of those guys are former uh, Maceo side men. Mm-hmm. And um, Will, though, that guy is just an incredible piano player. One of, the, one of the things I like to do with Will is find a grand piano, okay. go get my horn, and we just sit there and just go through the repertoire. Wow. Yeah, it'd be nice to just go to a small club and you guys go to town, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
I do a duo of will in a heartbeat. Right. <laughs> So, so once musicology tour ends, you know that that's just that's a, an idea you can kick around. And you know, well, you know, the musicology thing. Um, I think I just want to like keep that under wraps right, right now. But uh, you know, everybody can go to uh, mpgmusicclub.com. dot mm-hmm. com, and uh, every uh, well, it's great to have people uh, interested in in what's going on with uh, your your music uh, as far as working with Prince and, and your own thing with Maceo. A lot of buzz going on, I'm sure you guys are aware. And uh, a few days from now, you'll be on Jay Leno performing. That's right. And, uh, wow, that that should be like the third performance in quite a while, right? Short time, I mean. Well, we just did, um, yeah, the Fillmore two nights last weekend. and Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the things I said, you know, after we did that, I was like, you know, I need to go home. <laughs> yeah, right. Because <laughs> we had been out there recording. Well, not recording, but rehearsing right. and recording and stuff for like a month straight. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you throw the Grammy thing and then five shows up in there along with all of that, you know, just to kind of like see if all of that, well, see how much the rehearsal has come to fruit. Mm-hmm. You know, you just... I hadn't planned on being out there that long. It caught me off guard. Right. But it's so, nice to see the family, and I'm sure they're they're extremely happy to have you home. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, how how about um, some of your interests when you put down the the trombone and b- besides family? I know you're into bikes, different kinds of bikes. Still, You still get into that? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. As a matter of fact, um, anytime it goes above 50 degrees like it did today, uh-huh. uh, I like to roll a Harley out the garage, and and then I'll probably get back on a bicycle again. This year I hurt my back Oh, okay. Uh, about about the end of 2000. I went on a 100-mile ride, and then right after that I kind of like had a little accident. Ooh. And, um, well, not on the bike, but, you know, just. I guess I woke up the wrong way. Right. So I figured, you know, do some therapy and just being careful and ready to get back on a bicycle again. So, so when you're you're on these long tours, do you uh, what, what do you like to do uh, on the the rare chance you get some free time? Um, go sit in at a jazz club and shoot some pool. Yeah, that's another thing I saw. Yeah. So so challenging anybody in, in the MPG or Maceo's band, who would give you the biggest run on the table? Uh, let me see. Well, Maceo has a table in his basement. Uh-huh. Well, in his garage, rather. So, you know, he's pretty sharp. But, you know, they all come and they all go away unhappy. That's all I got <laughs> to say about it. And a few dollars <laughs> short, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I don't have a hustler mentality, man. Oh, okay. Just recreation. Yeah, yeah just recreation. I'm not a betting man. Right. Yeah, I, I threw out long a few years ago the uh, Jelly Bean Johnson was on the show, and we threw out uh, the best basketball players if he had to put a squad of five out in Minneapolis. So that, that was pretty interesting, too. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, do you keep, still keep up on sports? I know you talked about baseball was real big for you. Um. Not as much as I used to, and it's mostly due to the fact that there's ESPN now. Yeah. You know, I don't have to sit in front of a television three and four hours out of a day right. to watch a game when I can get the, the gist of it, you know, later on at night, mm-hmm. which frees up my day. You know, I'm kind of glad it happens that way, man. But a lot of things are going on in sports now that are just going right by me. And, you know, I mean, sometimes I feel bad about it, sometimes I don't because... You know, I like to think I have some athletic tendencies. Right. But, yeah, I, I try to keep up a little bit with what's going on. And so uh, right now we want to uh, let our listeners know that uh, you've been listening to the uh, interview with Mr. Greg Boyer, a longtime trombonist with uh, the P-Funk organization. 19 years, in fact, he was the arranger for the horns there and uh, just some great, great music all these years. And uh, also with Maceo Parker, kind of, you know, when Maceo goes on tour, oh, I, I wanted to ask you this myself. Yeah. Uh, when Maceo goes on tour and he doesn't have you, who does he put in for a trombonist? He, uh, if he can get a hold of Fred, he'll do that. He'll give him a call and, 
you know, Fred will come back out there and, you know, everybody's glad to see them back together again. So that's a, a wonderful thing to see. Plus, mm-hmm. you know, Fred is Fred, man. The guy's just, he's probably the funkiest trombone player that ever lived. And he's got a new book out, right? Oh, the book is hilarious. Uh-huh. Well, it's insightful. So, uh, also with Maceo Parker, and pick up Maceo's new CD available at whatarrecords.com and also maceo.com and you know, go to see Maceo whenever he's in your town. We have a lot of people from uh, Europe listening to our show, and, you know, you're going to have ample opportunity to see Maceo in the next few weeks. And, of course, uh, Greg Boyer right now, Horn Arranger and Trombonus with Prince in the new power generation, getting ready to embark on some serious touring and uh, hopefully a release of some studio work. Uh, just have to go to mpgmusicclub.com and... Uh, you know, hope to see you on the East Coast. We're going to catch you on at least one or two of the dates here. So, you're looking forward to that. Okay, there um, there are some dates posted on the Prince dot org, and the closest thing to East Coast that I saw was um, Pennsylvania, I think, right? Yep, yeah, yeah, uh, Penn State. Penn State, right? And Columbia, South Carolina, Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah, in April, and you know. At, at least what's, I guess, good for this tour so far has been, you know, a little advance notice for people to, to get tickets and, you know, so that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure that, you know, with all the space in between it, they'll probably fill those dates up with something close by any of those cities. Yeah. So so look out. Uh, we're based out of here, just out of New York City and Connecticut. and But, you know, the tour looks like it's going across the states and hopefully make its way overseas. So Yeah. Yeah. So... You, you got to rest up the next few days, which is which is great, and spend some well, I'm time. I'm not going to have time to rest. I oh, yeah. forget about that. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you got things to do with the family. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my son just got a, accepted to Frostburg State, so he's going to be going up there this weekend. And then Oh, my, wow, yeah. My daughter's in high school playing basketball, and my two youngest daughters, one's playing flute and speaking fluent French, and the other one is playing basketball and soccer. And, and then you know, being a newlywed as of the, this past September. Oh, congratulations! Well, thank yeah. you very much. Right. So, yeah, I got my work cut out for me, man. I yeah. gotta make, <laughs> I gotta cram, you know, a month or so of being gone into like a couple of days. Yeah, and then hopefully be able to catch them, you know, throughout the year. Yeah, I forget about dry cleaning. I'll just have to do that when I get back <laughs> yeah, out <right>. there. <laughs> yeah. How, how about traveling on tour? Do you travel light? To make it as simple as possible? I try to. Uh-huh. You know, there's some things that just won't let me make it light and simple. Like, all of a sudden, I left with one suit, and I came back home with about four or five. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I just, there's nothing I can do to get around that. Do you guys all travel together or split up and just make it out to the gig? We, well, once we get to wherever the city is, we all convene, and then, yeah, we travel together. But, right. Well, you know, I'm flying in from Baltimore, and nobody else lives here, so I just get to be on a plane with a bunch of strangers. Right. <laughs> so I put my mean face on and get the, the armrest, and I just go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you prefer to travel on the bus or, or by plane to the gigs? Um, it depends. A lot, I... A lot of things are cool about traveling by bus, which means you get to sleep all the way there. Mm-hmm. I mean, stretch out and sleep instead of just, you know, in 26D or whatever. Right. And, of course, flying gets you there faster. But with security issues, now you have to get to the airport, you know, two and three hours before it takes off. And then the flight's two hours, and then you got another hour before you get picked up. Ends up being almost as long to fly as it is taking a bus sometimes. So, so probably the most important people on tour, are getting you guys from city to city, you know, safely and on time, right? Yeah, I got to yeah. think, you know, if it's anything within like 300 miles from one city to the next, then the bus is definitely the way to go. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially, you know, you have the amenities, you get your your PS2s and your satellite dishes. and You get to watch ESPN. I can watch ESPN, yeah. Right, right. So, so uh, you know, you can go to uh, Greg's website, gregboyer.net, and uh, hopefully within uh, due time, uh, Greg gets into the studio and lays down some of that great music that he's talked about early in, in the uh, program here. And also, 
Uh, real nice thing. Greg Boyer is going to be answering, I think you said, 20 of the best questions Yeah. from the uh, listeners out there. Go into housequake.com. You can't miss it right on the front page. Is uh, Greg Boyer playing the trombone? And you can. Uh, well, what's the prize exactly? It's um, a backstage pass from a Prince concert in Hawaii. It's an actual laminate that the band uses. So I'm just going to go ahead and and sign it to whoever wins. Okay. I'm not going to just write my name on. I'm going to personalize it. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. And, and also, uh, there's time right now. You can uh, send the questions in and. Uh, you know, get some good ones in there. Yeah, and I don't know when the cutoff time is, but um, I think, well, I really can't say. I don't have any idea when the cutoff time is. I'm right. just waiting for the guy to write back and say, okay, you ready to go through these questions? And I'll say, uh, yeah, let's go. Yeah, but I, I think it's cool, you know, with the, with the Internet like that, you can, you know, everything's instantaneous now, which is great. Yeah. I mean, we don't even have to be at, at, at the Fillmore and a couple hours later, you know, we can get some kind of view on how the show went. So, hey, I yeah, would... but a lot of times you get opinions. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. Not necessarily a view. Yeah, it must it must be something when you guys are talking about the show and all the craziness people are talking about. So, oh but, yeah, yeah, a lot of laughs too, right? Plenty. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, so what what's your, what's your take percent on people getting it? Right? the same thing you would hear from person to person. Mm -hmm. It's an opinion, so of yeah. course it's going to differ, but aside from, say, be, say a set list or, you know, members of the band, you know, they will say, yeah, you know, and Fred Wesley was playing in the band. I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you, and, you know, speaking of the last show I went to see in Montreal, I read the, uh, the, uh, the review of that, and uh, they, they met, no, actually, it was the Montreal Jazz Festival, and the guy said there was a great bass player up there. He was wearing a nice white outfit, but he didn't know it was Larry Graham, you know. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> you got to shake your head when that happens. But you know, it's sad. But you know, there are a lot of people that write reviews and, and stuff, and basically all they do is work for a paper, and they're on assignment. They have no idea what they're watching or who they're watching mm -hmm. and they'll write anything right so yeah, uh some guy in a white suit playing bass yeah, yeah that's, that's a good one the bass player was good but you know we didn't catch his name <laughs> it's, so. it's a simple solution that that is right. ask <laughs> yeah that's right yeah ask ask somebody in the crowd most people know who he is yeah. i mean if you if it's your job to report this then you know go get the information this just, just show up and just let the pencil run willy-nilly over your pad and then just go back and say here's my review right you know, report the whole thing <laughs> so so I, i'm i'm a little partial to uh to to montreal and i know they got their 25th uh anniversary coming up um be nice if you guys go up there this summer you know hey oh. you you played there several times right and the uh, demaria jazz festival uh no actually in montreal the montreal jazz festival Montreal Jazz. You, you played there with Maceo. Yeah, a couple I of times. You, uh, man, that was one of the longest shows I ever been to. It was the, uh, I think it was Club, uh, no, it was the, oh man, Club Soda maybe? I can't remember. Yeah. Well, I, it, it was a great show. James Carter opened up for you guys. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, so we'll just have to wait and see and check out all the websites, mpgmusicclub.com and, uh, we're looking forward to, to seeing you here on the East Coast, you know, within due time. So, gregboyer.net, and uh, thanks so much, Greg, for being a part of the Upper Room and Joe Kelly and WVOF. Hey, thanks for taking the time to call up, brother. Yeah, and we'll do it again. <laughs> okay.